Substitution is one of the six fundamental reaction types, and it involves the replacement of a group X, typically attached to carbon, with a group Y. In this video, I'll introduce you to the two most commonly studied substitution mechanisms, SN1 and SN2. Let's look at each reaction mechanistically first, then investigate when one mode of reactivity is favored over the other. I should state right now that both SN1 and SN2 lead to this kind of process overall, the replacement of a CX bond with a CY bond. SN1 and SN2 are both nucleophilic reactions, which means that the group doing the substituting, Y here, is a nucleophile, and the electrons in the new CY bond come from Y. That's why I've labeled this bond in red. In the SN2 reaction, these electrons quite literally displace the electrons of the CX bond, pushing them onto X, which leaves with an additional lone pair and its charge reduced by 1. We see that the charge of Y increases by 1 in this reaction because Y's lone pair becomes part of a new single bond. It formally loses one electron. In curved arrow notation, we draw the lone pair of the nucleophile Y attacking the electrophilic carbon atom attached to X. Then, we draw a second arrow to show X, the leaving group, taking a pair of electrons with it as the CX bond breaks. The reaction is called bimolecular because two molecules come together in the rate determining step. Let's look now at some typical examples of good leaving groups and good nucleophiles. Good leaving groups are able to stabilize negative charge. Can you think of another kind of compound good at stabilizing negative charge? Here are some of the most common examples of good leaving groups. The halogens, which are all very electronegative, hydronium ion, which forms neutral water when it leaves, and one that students often forget, the sulfonate group. You may see this abbreviated as OTS, ONS, or OMS, depending on the R group. Before you start memorizing these structures, consider what they all have in common. Pause the video now and see if you can identify what all of these groups have in common. Now, imagine adding an H to each group. What do you have? A set of five very strong acids. Good leaving groups are the conjugate bases of strong acids. A good rule of thumb is, if the pKa of an acid is less than zero, its conjugate base is a good leaving group. It's important to recognize what we can rule out as impossible using this idea. Carboxylates, for instance, despite their resonance stabilization, are not good leaving groups because their pKa is too high. They have a pKa of about 5. Neutral alcohols are also not good leaving groups. The pKa of water, 15, is much too high. Strong nucleophiles are very important for the SN2 reaction pathway. As you might expect, they have the opposite properties of good leaving groups. They contain highly unstable or polarizable negative charges. Here are some examples. Notice that with the exception of the thiolate and iodide anions, good nucleophiles can be strong bases. The tendency to attack a proton, then, is analogous to the tendency to attack an electrophilic carbon. The reactive lone pairs on these negatively charged atoms are yearning to attack an electrophilic carbon atom to neutralize the charge. You'll see when we discuss elimination that these first three compounds, which are all strongly basic, are actually quite bad at substitution due to competing elimination. Weak nucleophiles still must possess a lone pair, but it's typically on a neutral rather than anionic atom. Keep this distinction of strong and weak in mind, as it will become important shortly when we discuss deciding between SN1 and SN2. Now that we've seen all the players in SN2, let's explore the action a little more deeply. We said that it's a one-step process in which the CX bond breaks as the CY bond forms. If this is the case, then the lone pair orbital on the nucleophile, which we can envision just as a lobe containing the lone pair, must be inducing the CX bond to break. It does this by overlapping with the CX bond's antibonding orbital, which extends primarily behind each atom involved in the bond. In this video, watch as the umbrella of CH bonds flips to the right as the nucleophile attacks. The result is an inversion of configuration at the electrophilic carbon. Let's draw a more descriptive SN2 reaction that reflects this idea. Notice that in substituting Y for X, a and B have flipped from pointing to the upper left to pointing to the lower right. 
If y and x were identical, this would correspond to an inversion of configuration, an exchange in the positions of two groups attached to the electrophilic carbon. If you don't believe me, then build a model yourself and convince yourself. SN2 proceeds with an inversion of stereochemistry. Note, however, that unless the electrophilic carbon is a stereocenter, you don't have to worry about stereochemistry. At this point, we can also begin to think about the effect of steric hindrance on the SN2 reaction. The nucleophile needs room on the backside to attack, but if the electrophile is attached to three alkyl groups, the nucleophile is unable to access the electrophilic carbon from the back. Thus, SN2 cannot take place at tertiary electrophiles, which are attached to three alkyl groups. However, you'll soon see that these substrates are perfect for the SN1 reaction, which we'll talk about next. The good news about SN1 is that many of the players are the same as those in the SN2 reaction. An electrophilic carbon, leaving group, and nucleophile are still involved. However, the SN1 reaction differs mechanistically from the SN2 reaction. It takes place over at least two steps, with the rate determining or slow step being the initial dissociation of the leaving group to form a cation at the electrophilic carbon. The curved arrows are similar, but the two arrows of the SN1 mechanism are spread out across two steps now. The cationic intermediate that forms is flat and sp2 hybridized. This implies that the configuration of the product will be scrambled, will get equal amounts of a compound with A up and B down, and a compound with B up and A down. What's the key experimental difference from SN2 here? We've discussed some important mechanistic differences, but how do we know which mechanism is operating given nothing but reaction conditions, and a substrate. The key experimental difference is the presence of a weak rather than a strong nucleophile in the reaction conditions. Because the nucleophile is weak, it's unable to push off the substrate's leaving group, and thus that group has to depart on its own. That requirement brings its own set of problems, however, because only tertiary or resonance stabilized cations are stable enough to be reasonable under SN1 conditions. All in all, we can say that only tertiary or resonance stabilized electrophiles can perform SN1, and except in very rare cases, SN1 only occurs in the presence of a weak nucleophile. Now let's bring it all together and summarize the dependence of substitution mechanism on the structures of the electrophile and nucleophile. Primary electrophiles are positively unable to undergo SN1 because that would require primary cations. However, they're poised for SN2 in the presence of weakly basic but strong nucleophiles, like the thiolate anion. Secondary electrophiles may undergo slight SN1 in protic solvents, which have hydrogens that can hydrogen bond to stabilize the charged intermediates, but generally give no useful reaction. They undergo some SN2 when strong nucleophiles are used, but elimination is competitive, as we'll see. And finally, Tertiary electrophiles are positively unable to undergo SN2, but may undergo SN1 when weakly basic nucleophiles are used.